Welcome to the video course on how to improve your decision making. I am Grandmaster Davrin Kuljašević and my goal in this course will be to help you make uh, better decisions in your games and also to avoid some uh, typical mistakes. Uh, before we take a look at uh, the structure of this course and the material that will be used, uh, let me uh, share with you my motivation for making this kind of a course and also uh, what I think will benefit the most uh, from studying this material. So firstly my motivation came from my students, uh, most of which are uh, club level players, somewhere in the 1600 to 20 to 2300 uh, range uh, feeder rating. And um, in, by looking at their games and analyzing with them, uh, I have noticed some typical uh, patterns in the way they make decisions and also the mistakes they tend to make. And uh, this is also uh, uh, who I think will benefit the most. So uh, this course is uh, made for mostly club players uh, because maybe they will recognize uh, some of their mistakes uh, and uh, how they can uh, improve the level of their play by eliminating them. And so let's uh, talk about what, what kind of mistakes uh, these, these typically are and, and uh, uh, what kind of uh, thinking uh, can be improved. So for this I would like to use uh, a theory on decision making by Jacob Agar. Uh, who is a well-known author and you may have read uh, something from him because he, he he's quite prolific. Uh, so if you're familiar with this uh, theory, that's great. Then it will be easier to uh, understand, surely. Uh, so basically the theory is uh, like this. We have in a game we, we make or four types of decisions are possible. Uh, we have uh, automatic decisions, simple decisions, uh, strategic decisions, and critical moments. And I think this is a pretty accurate uh, model for uh, the types of decisions that we uh, make in the game. Uh, so the first type, two types of decisions, uh, automatic and simple, uh, are those that don't require too much time to make, or at least they shouldn't. Uh, and also they are pretty straightforward for most players, uh, except for maybe beginners. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, automatic decisions are uh, forced moves uh, in the opening, uh, uh, automatic recaptures, uh, your king is in check, so you have only one legal move, things like that. Uh, the second uh, type of decision, simple decision, uh, these are usually um, some intuitive positional decisions such as transfer a piece to a better square, uh, improve the position of your king, uh, just something that is also fairly straightforward for, any, for anyone with uh, uh, decent chess education. Uh, so these two types of decisions are not too problematic. It's actually the other two, uh, strategic uh, decisions and critical moments uh, where most mistakes are made. And so, just just to uh, shortly explain, uh, strategic decisions are those that uh, have long-term consequences. Um, so basically, uh, you can't fully calculate them through, usually. Uh, you just have to rely on, on uh, your general or your positional intuition. Um, so, you know, these are decisions about the pawn structure, uh, or peace exchanges, some other positional transformations, uh, such as uh, uh, transferring from middle game to end game, and things like that. So, uh, for these, you need some general knowledge. Uh, and uh, as I said, you can't really fully calculate them through. Uh, so, if you rely mostly on your calculation to make decisions, then these will be the types of decisions where you make uh, the most mistakes. Uh, on the other hand, uh, critical moments uh, are the opposite. These are short-term decisions, uh, but also very important because these are the moments when the game usually uh, takes a turn uh, in one way or another. 
and if you don't uh, file, uh, you, if you don't find the right move, then uh, it will go. The game will go against you. But if you do, then uh, you might get a winning position or a big advantage. Uh, so this is also the type of uh, situation where uh, generally club players tend to make mistakes. Uh, not always, of course, but there are some typical situations we will see where this happens, usually by missing uh, opponent's resources uh, or missing some tactical opportunities uh, and so on. Uh, so our focus will be in this course on these two types of decisions. And I will also like to point out one other uh, mistake in decision-making process that's quite common. I've noticed, and this is uh, what I call uh, emotional elimination method. Uh, basically, uh, let me explain the situation. So you see, you have a position and you see a move that you like. Uh, and at first it feels like this should be the right move. So you start to calculate, analyze, and you see that uh, for the most part it looks good, but there is something, some move or some a problem about it, uh, uh, something annoying, like maybe your opponent gets a sudden counterplay which you don't want to allow, or you don't like the pawn structure that arises after that. And uh, you look at it a little bit more, you spend like 10 minutes, and then uh, because you don't like it, you start looking for another move. And you see some other move and you say, okay, this looks pretty good. Since the first move, I, since I don't like the first move, let's play this second move and for this on this second move you spend much less time you spend maybe two or three minutes so basically this is elimination method you eliminate uh, the first move and this is also emotional decision it's not because you like the second move but it's mostly because you don't like the first move and a lot of times this approach uh, leads to mistakes uh, you don't calculate the second uh, move uh, fully and uh, only late to, it's too late to re you realize that uh, it's a mistake. Uh, so we will see some examples in the course of this type of mistake. Um, so also I want to point out that uh, when you analyze your games, uh, of course we all use engine uh, to to see to check for correctness. Uh, and a lot of times it seems like once you look at uh, the game with the engine, you understand everything. You understand where you made mistakes. But what the engine doesn't give you is explanation why you made the mistake. And uh, this is very important. Th this feedback is very important because if you want to, let's say, stop making such mistakes in the future and improve your uh, level, uh, then you need to understand why it happened. And for this, uh, I think it's very important to have the help of um, either a good coach or uh, to read a book on the subject or let's say a course like this, uh, which will explain to you uh, how to uh, improve your decision, decision making process. Uh, so let's now go into some details on the course. Uh, so this will be a slightly different course in a sense that uh, we will not quite look at uh, instructive games of strong players, uh, but rather we will look at uh, typical mistakes uh, of regular players. And this can be quite instructive as well. I explained why, why, we'll, why we uh, will take such an approach, uh, simply to uh, be aware of them and to identify them in uh, our own games. Uh, so for this purpose, I have uh, compiled uh, more than 100 games, a little bit over 100 games of my students, and I have analyzed them to uh, try to find these typical mistakes. Um, so the result is that we will have uh, 10 chapters, uh, and we will look at the different topics that I will uh, shortly enumerate. Um, so, it, there will be 20 videos in total, uh, around uh, 10 hours of running time, so this is quite an extensive course. Uh, I think the topic deserves it, so uh, I hope that uh, you will find it uh, uh, interesting.
and uh, the topics that we will cover are as I explained some of them are uh, strategic in nature some of them will cover critical moments uh, so let me just take a look at my list so that I don't forget something so the first topic that we will cover here are peace exchanges and this is quite an important one so we'll spend a lot of time on it uh, then the second one is very uh, it's, it's connected to it it's avoiding simplification uh, and avoiding simplification the difference compared to peace exchanges is this uh, there is a pattern especially with weaker club players to uh, just exchange as soon as they see a possible exchange to simplify things to make uh, things easier for them uh, but the thing here is that uh, not every exchange improves their position and also a lot of times if you uh, don't really think those exchanges through uh, you miss something you, you miss a good opportunity for yourself and so uh, we'll take some take a look at some typical uh, mistakes in, in these types of positions uh, another type of strategic decision is about the pawn structure so those that define again in in the long term what your pawn structure will be uh, then we'll take a look at strategic uh, center decisions uh, after that we'll take a look at some positional transformations uh, those are basically when uh, several factors in the position change so maybe not only pawn structure but also the position of pieces and things like that uh, the next topic is piece deployment so how to uh, use our pieces how to improve them uh, and uh, and achieve harmony with other pieces and the last topic uh, that concerns strategic uh, decision making is uh, which flank to play on so uh, a lot of times uh, a mistake that people are not even aware of is that they just focus on the wrong flank uh, they think that uh, they should play on the queen side but actually uh, they don't have enough resources to play on the other, on that side of the board and they should have really focused uh, on the other side uh, so uh, these are the strategic uh, topics uh, now let us focus on critical moments so a very big topic there will be awareness of opponents resources this is the number one type of mistake that happens uh, so if you increase your awareness of what your opponent uh, can or wants to do uh, I believe that this improves your practical strength by by a lot uh, so th that's something that we will study carefully uh, then uh, we'll take a look at uh, critical moments basically uh, these are decisions uh, mostly where there is only one good move and how to find uh, the right move in such situations and the last topic will be endgame technique uh, these are also also usually critical uh, decisions because uh, in endgames your margin for error is quite small uh, a lot of times uh, if you make a mistake uh, it often can be a decisive one uh, so or if you make the right move it can promise you a draw or a win uh, so in endgame there's there's not uh, too much you know uh, white is slightly better or black has an initiative kind of thing it's it's usually win or draw for one of the sides so these are the topics that we will cover um, and the goals of this course overall will be as I said to improve your awareness of, of typical mistakes and the, the decision-making process uh, and because sometimes just being aware of what kind of decision uh, you're about to make uh, helps you make the right decision indeed uh, second goal is to be able to identify your weakness uh, in certain areas so uh, my suggestion when you go through the course is uh, from time to time pause the video when you see a new position and try to find uh, a solution to the position and if you find yourself um, 
making typical mistakes all over again uh, in, in certain type of position it probably means that this is the area where uh, you you know you something is uh, can be improved in your decision making process uh, so definitely this would be my strong recommendation as as i go through the video i will uh, you know i'll stop when there is a new position i will say okay it's white to move it's black to move this is the this is what the position is about this is the the goal uh, for white or for black and then uh, of course stop the video try to find the solution yourself don't be a passive viewer try to uh, make this active for yourself so that you can uh, get the most benefit um, so this is the second goal to try to identify your own weaknesses and of course uh, the ultimate goal is to learn something new and useful uh, about uh, decision making something that will be practical for you and that you can use in your own games um, so with all that being said uh, let me wrap up wrap up the introduction part uh, and start already looking at some material uh, to introduce some topics that uh, we will take a look at in the course so the first topic is uh, how to exchange our pieces which are good exchanges and which are not good exchanges uh, and the approach that I will take in these examples is I will tell you the background uh, so uh, of, of the decision that uh, each player made uh, so the position let's say that we have here on the board is, is from a game uh, from a student of mine who played with black his rating is around 2000 uh, and in this position uh, he made the wrong exchange so I will try to explain his process uh, it's helpful when you talk to someone and you ask him okay why did you make this wrong decision and he will tell you okay I thought that I will get this or that in return I thought it was a good decision because of this and that and then uh, you understand a little bit better why they made this decision uh, so I will try to do that in pretty much every example uh, so we'll see both pros and cons of uh, decisions because people don't make decisions just usually they, they don't make illogical decisions they always have some sort some sort of logic but the thing is that if this decision is wrong then probably something in the decision making process was wrong so let us start with this position it is black to move he's down a pawn but we can see that he has a certain compensation in this end game because uh, the bishop on b3 is quite a passive piece and the passed pawn on the c file can be blocked so a logical move in this position is the one that blocks the pawn knight to b7 and after that if white wants to push the pawn with rook d5 uh, the, the knight can come back and uh, the bishop is pinned so black will or white will also have to come back with the rook and we will repeat the position which means no progress for white uh, so basically in this type of position as i said uh, black should have compensation for the pawn however in the game black took black took the bishop and this is a big big mistake uh, this exchange is wrong for two reasons firstly the bishop on b3 was a very passive piece and also the knight if we if it could come from b7 to c5 would be a pretty good piece uh, controlling a lot of squares so that's one reason why this is a mistake and the second reason is that after a takes b3 uh, black gets improves his pawn structure or white improves his pawn structure and gets a protected pass pawn on the c file and for end games this is a huge asset now why did black make this mistake of course in theory he understands that uh, when when we talk about this in hindsight he understands that, that, that this is a positionally wrong decision but why did he do it in the game um, well he thought that his rook on a3 is very passive and he wanted to open up the a file for it 
Uh, but you see that this is a bad trade-off for black. He activates his rook. Uh, and his idea is if white plays king f3 to uh, put it on b3. Oh, sorry, on b2 to put the pressure on the b3 pawn. But the downside that he didn't appreciate is that white can sacrifice this g pawn temporarily and go and pick up the b4 pawn. After that, white has two connected pawns on the queen side and he also has a king to support them. And he's much faster than black in pushing his pawns. So white uh, eventually won this endgame. Also, you see that uh, black king is cut off from the uh, queen side, so it can't really help in stopping these pawns. Uh, so basically, this is why black lost. He allowed the uh, white to have connected past pawns and uh, he also helped him by uh, trading his worst piece, the bishop. Uh, so when you have such decisions, uh, when there is a trade-off between two positional factors, uh, you have to think them uh, through very carefully because uh, this, this is forever basically. No, this is the decision that you can't uh, take back. Uh, so, you know, you give something to white and you don't have to do it. So this is a much more, knight b7 is a much more fluid move. Uh, you might take on b3 later, at some point later, if it's a better moment. Uh, but if you do it now, then you have to think, think it through very carefully. And in this case, it, it was just a mistake. Okay, let us take a look at another example of uh, an exchange, a wrong exchange. Here it is black to move. And we can see that he's up a pawn. He has a bishop pair and a more active position. Uh, so basically he has all chances to win this game. Uh, now, in this position, what would you play with black? And the other question, would you capture on c3? Would you trade this pawn, this uh, bishop for a knight? So in the game, black did it. He took on c3, and his reasoning was that there will be uh, an isolated pawn on c3 that he would be able to attack. However, this is a positional mistake. This is a wrong trade. First of all, if we come back here, the bishop on, c, uh, on e5 is much more powerful than the knight on c3. So for that reason alone, just like in the previous game with the exchange on b3, we have to think this through very carefully. Are the benefits uh, of taking on c3 you know, big enough for me to trade actually this strong piece for not such a strong piece? Uh, so I want to suggest that instead of this, there was a more flexible move once again. And the one that can use uh, strengths of this bishop, so the move h5, uh, basically we want to attack on the king side maybe later we'll play g6 king g7 rook h8 a typical plan and uh, use uh, the strength of our bishop pair to play on both sides of the board uh, and once again we can always take on c3 if it's the right moment we have this option but if we take immediately on c3 uh, then we cannot take it back and now the only question is, does black have enough pressure on the c3 pawn? And the answer is no, because black forgot that white can play rook d4. And now suddenly white has a strong centralized rook on d4. And even though this is still should be a winning position uh, for black in the long run, it becomes more difficult to win it. Uh, because we, positionally we didn't make such a good exchange and we helped... Uh, uh, white to uh, activate his pieces somewhat with the move rook d4. Okay, let us take a look at another and very similar instance of wrong exchange. Here, if you were black, what would you play? So, black is down a pawn, but um, white king is extremely weak. This is obvious. And if we look at uh, the strength of this uh, bishop on e5 compared to the knight on g3 uh, so it, it's just uh, shocking how, how 
much better these pieces. Uh, so in the game, of course, you can try to attack, you know, play a move like king f7 and then bring the other rook into the attack, like rook c8, rook c3. But black, who is actually quite a decent 2300 player, took on g3. And his thinking here was that he's forcing queen g3 and just taking on a2 and this should be winning. Uh, however, it turns out that after king c1, even though he has won a pawn, there's no mating uh, for, for a forced checkmate there. And the thing is that black king is also weak. Once this happens, f6 is weak. And so after a few more checks, uh, he just runs out of them, basically. And this position, while it's better for black, it's not winning at all. So... Uh, as I said, both kings are exposed, so uh, definitely black can't count, count on a decisive advantage here. Uh, so coming back here, after bishop takes g3, uh, white should have taken on g3, but in the game he took on f6, and after king e7, uh, his, his attack didn't wasn't successful, and black won. But as I said, if he had, uh, if White had taken on g3, that would be a different story. Uh, then uh, he would still have chances to save the game. Uh, so it's it's just a bad positional decision to take on g3. Now it's a concrete decision because uh, you are uh, you are winning a pawn after all. But it's just not enough. You know, it's not it's not enough to win a pawn. Uh, it's not worth it. It's better to keep the bishop on e5 and play a move like king f7. And uh, then you just bring the other rook and rook c8, rook c3, for example, and should be completely winning. Uh, so it's, it's usually these types of mistakes that cannot be taken back, you know, that you have to uh, consider carefully. And if you don't see enough benefit for yourself, uh, try to refrain from them and uh, play a move like this, king f7. You keep your positional advantages, and you can always take on g3 later in in, in a better moment. Uh, but first, improve your position like this. Don't don't give up your positional um, advantages. Let's see another example here of a wrong exchange. Here we're looking from White's perspective. Uh, so in this position, White is worse. Uh, nothing. Uh, there's nothing uh, unusual about this because black has a knight on d5 and white has a passive bishop. But in such positions, you should not trade your best pieces. And uh, the most active white pieces, of course, the knight on e4. Uh, it's well centralized. It can jump to c5 to block the c file. And uh, the player with white is quite an unexperienced player who uh, basically tends to exchange pieces at, at every possible opportunity. Uh, not really realizing when it's a good exchange and when it is not. So here, not surprisingly, he took on c3, not appreciating that after this, uh, let's say knight takes c3, he will be left with a bad, only a bad bishop against a strong knight. Uh, and this is a very uh, unpleasant endgame to play, especially considering that he has all his pawns on the dark squares. Uh, so... Okay, besides g2, but most of his pawns are on the dark squares. Uh, so in such a position, you shouldn't trade your strongest piece. You should play, let's say, move like g4. Uh, your, as I said, your knight can go to c5 later. Maybe you trade uh, some pawns with f5. And you have pretty decent drawing chances here. Even though you're positionally worse, the material is limited. And uh, I don't think that uh, white should be... Uh, too concerned here if he plays his cards right. But this exchange helps black a lot. Uh, now, black made the wrong decision too. He exchanged uh, his rooks and this diminishes his winning potential because uh, he can only attack these pawns with his knight and perhaps his king, but this is not enough to win the game with best defense. So instead of this, should have taken, as I said, uh, with the with the knight, and that way 
uh, he will keep at least one rook and it's going to be easier to attack these weak pawns in the endgame. And let us take a look at one more example here, quite instructive. Uh, so in this position, uh, black was a lower rated player, uh, 2100 playing against a 2300. And uh, take some time to try to see what you would play. The material is equal, but black seems to be more active. Uh, he has uh, very strong bishops. Uh, and also he controls the c-file. So the only thing that white has going for him is his uh, queenside majority, but it's blocked, so he can't really push these pawns forward. And here white, uh, black played the move rook c1, which is a mistake, it's a positional mistake, uh, or a strategic mistake, because uh, this exchange only helps uh, white to, first of all, get rid of his passive rook. Uh, secondly, he gets some squares which he didn't have before, like uh, knight d4, bishop c5. And also after the move bishop d1, he's able to finally push his um, queenside majority. Uh, the position is still equal, but white won the game uh, very quickly because black just uh, didn't really know what he was doing in this endgame. And he just tried to trade the pieces. And we said that this simplification uh, uh, type of thinking, uh, where you just want to make things easier for yourself, uh, very often backfires. So this is one typical example. We should keep the tension here instead and play a move like, let's say, knight a4 or bishop f6. Either way. So one, one of these two simple moves will work. And uh, the bishops are very strong, and as, as I said, this rook uh, on b1 is, is quite passive, we control the c-file, um, and black can think about uh, playing for a win here. But, and especially in the view of this, if white goes bishop d1 to push a4, the rook is almost trapped on b1, rook b3, rook c1. So. This would uh, promise black an advantage, but instead of this he went for the simplification. He made the wrong exchange, uh, and because of this he lost the game. So, these are some of the typical mistakes when it comes to peace exchanges. We will uh, study this uh, to even uh, greater detail in the upcoming uh, two videos, uh, and we will see some typical uh, wrong exchanges. Uh, so I hope that uh, this will be an interesting uh, topic for you. Uh, it's, it's definitely a very common source of uh, mistakes. Uh, so stay tuned and then in the next video we will continue with instructive examples.